Hello and welcome to Fermenting Opinions. I'm your host, David Papiden, and this is Fermenting Opinions uh, takeover of the Free Thought Productions channel. Uh, I am here today to moderate a debate on the virgin birth uh, between uh, Nick Peters and John Edwards, and very excited uh, to do this, and I want to bring those guys on. Uh, I'm not actually controlling the show, uh, so I'm going to leave the actual host to, to bring folks in so that so that they can introduce themselves and we can get started. And also want to apologize, there's been a little bit of uh, tech issues going on here, so there's been a delay of game because we were supposed to start around one, and it's about quarter after now. But Please come on in, gents, uh, when you, when you hear this, and and then we can get going. Hello, David. Hey. I'm I'm here because uh, Nick periodically disappeared from his camera view. I'll bring him on in a minute. Okay. But, uh, thanks, thanks for hosting this, and thanks for setting it up and getting everybody organized. And absolutely, let's let's face it, technology sometimes doesn't work, so we're we're a bit late. Can't yes. be helped. That's um, that's definitely what we're looking at right now. Um, having just some some tech issues, we want to get to this debate. If anyone knows, and I'm going to let Nick introduce himself and kind of go through the whole spiel. Oh, is he there? Yeah, I'm here. Fantastic. I I think I I misidentified you. By the way, I called you John Edwards instead of Richards. I'm so I'm so sorry about that. Um, anyway, so we've got Nick here with us as well. Nick, um, would you want to go ahead and uh, introduce yourself? And because because I wanted to talk about the topic, but what is it about this topic that's so interesting to you? And if anybody knows Nick, uh, I'm kind of like feeding him the answer to this one. <laughs> well, I, I can definitely say I do affirm the virgin birth. Yes. But and for anyone watching, I'm having to do this on my phone because of the technological issues involved. Uh, so my thanks to William for letting me be the go-to between us. So why does this topic matter? Where I, I think before that, I should actually tell a bit about, my, about myself here. My name's uh, Nick Peters. I do apologetics at deeperwatersapologetics.com. And I am on the autism spectrum. That's a big factor in what I do, raising awareness for that. My interest is in New Testament studies and philosophy as well, uh, several different areas. But this one's important because I figured, why not talk about the virgin birth, which I do affirm, around Christmas time and get people talking about that one. And it's important because this set a whole narrative in motion for Jesus and eventually gets to his resurrection. I mean, I, I think it's been said Jesus is either the son of God or he's the son of Joseph. And there's a time when uh, David Lehrman was actually interviewing Larry King and asking him, if you could interview anyone from any time in history, who would you interview? And he said, maybe Jesus Christ. And he said, and what would you ask him? He said, I'd ask him if he was born of a virgin. To me, that answer would, that would explain all of history. So that's why I'm here. And again, I can be found at deeperwatersapologetics.com. Fantastic. And John, I know this is your channel, but uh, but please introduce yourself and we're, we're going to pretend like it's not your channel. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, I, I've already put your uh, your channel up here. I'll, I'll show it again. Oh, yes. Nice. This is uh, fermenting opinions. I'm just <laughs> the temporary <laughs> host. For sure. Yeah. So why am I here? It's because my current role is as president of Atheism UK. And so people thought that Nick and I should have a debate about uh, the virgin birth. And this is it. Very good. Very good. Well, I'm so pleased to have you both on here. Uh, John, this is the first time you and I have spoken live. We've spoken several times in the past, have interacted on the Unbelievable page. Nick, I've actually had on my show, um, it's been a couple of years, I think, um, but he's joined a couple of live shows with me, and, and so I know him from that. Um, and it's good to see him again. It's good to see you again, Nick. Uh, mm -hmm. So with that said, the way this is going to be structured for, for anybody watching is we're going to do 15 minutes for openings for each of you. Um, we're going to start with Nick. Uh, in his openings, and each person is then going to have five minutes 
to do a rebuttal. And then after that, we're going to open up the conversation for the remainder of the time. Uh, I like to have some structure, but I'm not an overly formal guy. Anybody knows me. Um, I want this to be a conversation primarily, um, but we need to get these sort of initial ideas out there first. So uh, with that said, uh, Nick, whenever you are ready to go, you let me know, okay? And I'll start the time. Okay, uh, 15 minutes, right? Yes, sir. Okay. No. Are you, are you ready? I can go ahead and start. Yeah. Here. All right. Yeah, I thought you just were going to start. Me. Sorry, just go ahead and start okay. talking and then I'll start the timer. Okay. Jesus Christ is the most pivotal person in all of history. The calendar starts and ends with him. We have B.C. and A.D., or today we say B.C.E. and C.E. Either way, it centers around Jesus Christ. No one has had more influence on history than Jesus Christ. And the question asked about him to this day still is, who is he? There are people who think he never even existed, which is definitely not a position treated seriously by scholarship. There are many who think, like myself, that he's the son of God who came and died and rose from the dead physically, and he was born of a virgin, which I do affirm. And there are various other positions. There are skeptics of Christianity who think that, yes, Jesus lived and he was, say, for instance, an apocalyptic prophet, such as Bert Ehrman. But the idea that he rose from the dead or that he did miracles or anything like this, it's not really accurate. All these positions are still being debated today. And today we're going to focus on one aspect of that, and that will be the virgin birth, which I do affirm. Now, in looking at the virgin birth, which I do affirm, I'm only going to have two other parts that would really make my argument necessary to and that's to simply say God exists and miracles are possible. I don't want to spend a lot of time on those, though, because those are separate debates. But I would say if you want to look at the existence of God, I do typically go with the Thomistic arguments. And I think I agree where with C.S. Lewis when he said, if you establish God exists, then you have to be open to miracles. But we're going to be looking at the evidence for the historicity of a miracle of a virgin birth, which I do affirm. At the start, we have the accounts in the Gospels, and these accounts are really quite early in comparison to many other accounts in history. If we look at Luke's Gospel, for example, when the angel speaks to Mary, he t the angel tells her, that Jesus will establish a kingdom that will have no end. Now, if you're a good Jew listening to this, you're going to be thinking, the kingdom of God, the Messiah ruling, yes, that's going to come. If you're a Gentile listening, you might be thinking a kingdom like Caesar's, for instance, a political rule. That's what's going to happen. But anyone whether you're talking about before or after 70 AD, would be looking and saying, where is this kingdom? The Gentile is not going to see Jesus sitting in Rome, for instance, on the chair of Caesar ruling. And the Jewish person is going to say, where well, geez, how come God's reign isn't being established all over the earth right now? This would not be something that you would make up in the account to put in. And I, I think it shows it's rather early with this. Now, Luke also is a great historian, we know in many ways, especially from works like the Book of Acts, which is the sequel. As Colin Hemer and others have gone through and documented many cases where Luke gets things extremely accurate and if john wants to bring up the topic of say the census the reason the census is so debated also is because luke is generally someone who does get things 
extremely right. And so people look and say, well, this seems to be an exception to this. <clears throat> and the exception is one that proves a rule that he usually does get things pretty accurate. <laughs> now, some people might say this is something that's taken from pagan mythology. If it was, which is extremely unlikely, this is really very calm in comparison. Suppose we were told there was a movie that was going to star, say, the guy featured as the sexiest man alive and the hottest woman you can imagine in a romance. And we were promised in the film things would get very steamy. And all you see is them going behind the door and hearing it closing and hearing a lock clicking. You would think this isn't a steamy romance. Where when you look at pagan accounts of gods getting women pregnant, you find that it's very detailed in many ways. And it involves the lust of a god, especially Zeus. But in these accounts, there's nothing like that at all. And also, Jews were very much on guard against having their beliefs tinged with paganism at all. You would not want to especially implicate Yahweh in all this. Now, if this account came from Mary, what we have to say is Mary is lying, supposedly, if it didn't happen, about the virgin birth, which I do affirm. And we'd have to ask, when did she come up with the idea to lie? Did this happen shortly after the event when she got pregnant? Well, if she did, this really doesn't make much sense because who would believe the story right off? Would Joseph hear the story and say, oh, that makes perfect sense and be okay? Well, the story... And Matthew's gospel indicates that when he heard, he decided to divorce her privately because he knew what it takes to make a baby. And he knew he hadn't done that, so he knew someone else had. And if you were making this up, why would you implicate Yahweh? Why couldn't Mary just say either she was unfaithful or she was raped? Both of which would be even more believable in account of a virgin birth, which I do affirm. <clears throat> now, if this came later, we still have a problem because you have people who could still be around who knew the events, such as Jesus had brothers and sisters. I know some of my Catholic friends might not agree with that or my Orthodox friends, but I do hold that Jesus did have genetic brothers and sisters, but with different father, of course. And you still could have followers of John the Baptist around who could say this. And we would even have to ask, why did Jesus become such a prominent figure? And for that, we need to have some reason for believing the resurrection, which is a whole separate debate that shows that Jesus had to have been a well-known figure in order to, to have these accounts. We also have to say that there was really no reason that the, that the birth of Jesus had to be mentioned. Mark and John don't mention it. Paul doesn't mention it at all. But when, when it is mentioned, it does bring up the charges of illegitimacy which is something that you would not want in your Messiah. You would do anything you could to avoid any, any sort of damage to his reputation at all. Now, sometimes we'll be told that there are pagan parallels as well to the virgin birth, which I do affirm. For instance, Mithras is sometimes brought up as being born of a virgin. Where technically that could be true, it's quite likely that rock that he was born out of had never had sex with anyone. So technically, yes, you could say Mithras was born of a virgin. Or 
it could be considered the case of Horus and Isis, except Isis was very much not a virgin at all. And we could keep going on with so many other deities that come up, and these really aren't parallels. We can also point out this really isn't paralleled in the Jewish literature. Miraculous births do occur, but they are usually to women who are older and who are barren, or at least one of the two. Now, we could also consider that in Isaiah, we are told about a prophecy that's usually thought to be about the virgin birth, which I do affirm. And some will say, well, yeah, that event was <clears throat> talked about, but it refers to an Alma, which is a young girl and not necessarily a virgin. Couldn't the word Betula have been used instead? Well, a Betula often does refer to a virgin, but it doesn't have to necessitate one. And it's true that Alma doesn't have to necessitate one anyway, either. But the, the context does seem to indicate there's something unusual about this. Now, if it could have been a young woman, sure. But when we see the Septuagint, we see that it uses the word parphenos, which refers to a virgin. And that's what Matthew uses in his account, which refers to a virgin. So that would indicate the Jewish elite of the time thought that this did mean virgin. Now, who is this child that's born? Some might say it was Mahashala Hashbaz, who was described later in the chapter. And some could think it's Hezekiah, the good king. But something to keep in mind is that this refers to the house of David. Something very great going on on here because house of david is rarely used and i understand it's in the plural as well so what he is being said is ahaz you are a wicked king and someone is going to come after you who is going to take your place now we could say in a lesser sense this could have been fulfilled at the time but matthew is looking back and saying but the far greater sense of this being fulfilled is going to be in the life of Jesus. I, I would also contend that the fact that these accounts are so different means that they're both independent. And by that, by these two accounts, I mean Matthew and Luke. If one copied from the other, why would they make it so radically different? But if they both or independent accounts, they both seem to have the virgin birth, which I do affirm, which makes it something pretty interesting to consider that there is a tradition even earlier on that Jesus was born of a virgin, which I do affirm. What John is going to need to do in his presentation is make a case against this being probable and then make a better case for the origins of Jesus and the accounts that we have in the New Testament documents. And I really think that's going to be a very difficult time for him to have. But I'll see what he has. And for now, I still want to let everyone know that I do affirm the virgin birth. Very good. Um, you still got about a minute and a half left. Are you, do you want to cede that time? Yeah, I'll go on and see it. Okay. I will end you there then. Very good. And now we... Whoa. Okay. I'm getting a lot of echo. Right? Hey, can you mute that? Okay. Yeah. Are, are we better? Yeah. Okay, somewhat. Okay. All right. Let's move on then. Um, we're going to go to John. Um, John, I'll do it the same way. I'm going to let you go ahead and start. And then when you start talking, I'm going to start your time. Okay. Well, I've got a, a screen share uh, 
presentation as we talked. I've got uh, 12 slides, I think. Okay. So I'm going to put those on screen and run through them. So uh, let me see what should I do here. I'll let you bring it up and I'll, and I'll start time if that's okay. With yeah, you. sure. Sure. All right. Okay. So I take Nick down and he won't feed back to us. And uh, I'm going to take you down as, no, I'm going to leave you up, David, and share my screen. And then I'll start talking. Uh-huh. So add to stream. There's my screen share. I'm going to play. And yeah. I'm going. This is it. Right. Okay. So why is the virginity so highly prized? Now, can I make the slide change? Yes. So th these are the topics that I'm going to go through. Why is virginity so highly prized? About, I am going to talk about some of the other claimants to a virgin birth. And I'm on a live stream here. No, I'm just asking because I don't know. Can you check your app just to see when the food is going on? I'm going to pause your time. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, I've got trouble at home. This has been a, been a comedy of errors today. Yeah, yeah. Um, which, uh, as food will arrive when having hosted um from many opinions for a while now I, uh, yes. i'm a stranger to it well, it's gone <laughs> um, i expected to arrive at oh it's gone that sorry sorry about that guys <laughs> so you've got uh you're, you're about 35 seconds in so okay so if you would like to resume yeah i would be happy to resume okay so as nick suggested i'm going to talk about some of the other claimants to a virgin birth and I'm going to look at the evidence for Jesus's virgin birth. Nick seemed to refer to a single source, the Bible, and therefore he's, in fact, he mentioned the historicity. So he's looking at it from a historical point of view. Then I'm going to look at the biology of virgin births in general. And the name for that is parthenogenesis. And then I'm going to finish with a slide making my conclusions and what we should take away from this. Okay, so here we go. Uh, why is virginity so highly prized? Well, if you think that religions were fabricated by men for men, it becomes clear why virginity is highly prized. But and take a note that it's only the virginity of mothers of men, of mothers of baby boys, not mothers of baby girls. So let's investigate that. Why do you think that might be? So throughout the ages, female virginity has been big business. And it's because the death of a father who owns things causes disputes over inheritance. So to stop the brothers and the sisters fighting each other over who gets what, rules had to be made to divide up the spoils fairly. And of course, this is why we came up with the idea of primogenitor. The firstborn boy gets the priority. Uh, others might, the second sons, third sons might get some of the lesser uh, spoils. And the girls probably would get nothing because they could be sold to men. So marrying a virgin was the only way the father could be sure that he, when he died, wasn't going to give his inheritance away to some other bloke's kid. That's a big financial interest. And of course, that also gave rise to the concepts of legitimate and bastard. So before DNA testing was available, marrying a virgin was the only way you could be sure of paternity. And you can't catch a sexual disease off a virgin. That's a bonus. But the main point is the paternity one. You know you're the father of a virgin's child. If you're the only person that she's had sex with, it's a good bet her children are yours. Now, 
in olden days, we couldn't test for virginity. So uh, women who had lost their virginity, it was still important for them to pretend to be a virgin. So they had various methods to make it look as though they were still virgins. And in the 17th century in Venice, muslin bags were stuffed with mashed hearts of hares. They're like rabbits, only hairier. <laughs> and they were inserted into the vaginal cavity on the wedding night so that the nuptial bed sheets were stained with blood. And that demonstrated that the newlywed bride was a virgin. So she, if she passed that bloodied sheet test, she was worth every ducat of her dowry in Venice in the 17th century. There were other ways. You could repair a lost hymen and make it look as though the woman was still a virgin. And th this was done by, there were two, two ways in which this could be done. You could have an artificial hymen constructed and inserted. This was a prothesis that was adhered inside the vagina and it released a red liquid that looks like blood when disturbed. And the other way of doing that was by surgery and the particular surgery to recreate a hymen is hymenography, hymen reconstruction surgery. So virgin births have a social explanation. It's a tragic demonstration of the extreme measures that women have been forced to take to save themselves and their reputations. And it's just one example of, of a, a whole ramp of things that the religious have imposed on us. They've taken an impertinent interest in our sexuality. They love to stick their noses into our genitalia. And then they, of course, they have the traditional approval of purity and of arranged and forced marriages and the disapproval of adultery and homosexuality. And then, of course, there is the horror of honor killings. Now, because the air of dirtiness that the religious cast over the natural process of sexual reproduction, it was often thought better to claim virginity even when pregnant than to admit having had sex. And there's nothing new about this. I should deal with it a bit in a minute, but uh, this, this explains why women today still, even when pregnant and even given, having given birth, claim never to have sex. There was one occasion, uh, 9th of March, 2021, this very year, and another one here, what's the date of that? 18th of February, 2019, another virgin, <laughs> allegedly. This one was in China. Uh, that first one was in Hampshire and just down the road from where I live. So th this still goes on. Women don't want to admit to having had sex, even though they've become pregnant, even though they've given birth to a baby. And in this case, I see uh, the lady on the left gave birth to a daughter. Now, history is littered with virgins who gave birth. Uh, I think, what was it, Mithras that um, Nick mentioned. I haven't got him on my list, but there's a few there. There's Romulus and Remus. The virgin mother was Rhea Sylvia. There's Ra, the sun god, and the virgin mother was Net. Horus, mother Isis. Attis, mother Nana, Dionysus, isn't that Mithras by another name? Mother Semele or Persephone, we're not quite sure. And Jason, whose mother was Persephone, and Plato even gets in on the act. His virgin mother was Perictione. So there's no shortage of sons allegedly born of virgin mothers. So, and this is, this happens all over the world. You know, it's, it's happened in Hinduism, in Buddhism, and in ancient China. 
the myths abound. And none is more or less believable than any other fable. So if you believe virgin birth, why not believe them all? Please notice, though, and this is important, that these stories of virginity and birth are exclusively for the mothers of sons. Nobody's bothered about the virginity of mothers who produce daughters. So the evidence for virgin for Jesus's virgin birth, as Nick gave us, is, was entirely biblical. The question then arrives, is the Bible a reliable source of information? And for it to be a reliable source of information, good history, it would have to have independent, contemporary, corroborating documents that substantiate the story of the Bible. And it doesn't. Now, I know Nick will say that the Bible is actually a library and it contains several areas books in it. But of course, the evidence shows that they're all derived from one another. In the Gospels, and particularly, we know the order they were written in. They stole from each other some of the bits of the story. They're all a bit different. And then the latest one, John, is a sort of polished account. And so it, it, the whole thing looks very fishy. What Nick needs to do to substantiate his affirmation of Jesus's virgin birth is to demonstrate that the Bible is a reliable source. And I've had debates about that, and it isn't. So we could have a debate about that if Nick wants. I would be happy to. The so-called contemporary independent sources that corroborate the Bible, they usually quote the Roman historians Josephus and Tacitus, but they weren't born at the time of Jesus's living. And there's no evidence that they were ever in Galilee. And the references that they quote, well, that they make, only mention a wandering Jewish prophet, no name. So in a nutshell, the Bible is merely hearsay. That's all the Bible is. It's hearsay. And faced with this, theists often claim that the virgin birth is a miracle. Well, for that to be convincing, you'd have to demonstrate that miracles actually occur. And that's not going to be easy. And unless you can produce that miracles actually occur, and this particular miracle did occur, what you're doing there is trying to support a proposition with another proposition. And that's known as an ad hoc fallacy. Now, virgin birth does happen. We call it parthenogenesis. And it's a natural form of asexual reproduction in which embryos develop in the absence of fertilization. It's most common in plants. I mean, you can think of strawberry plants, for example, that go on making daughter plants all over the ground if you give them a chance. There's lots of plants that do this. Some do it on top of the ground, some do it underneath. Think of a nettle bed, think of brambles. And also invertebrate animals quite commonly do it. There's bees that are unfertilized. Uh, the, the, um, the worker bees are unfertilized eggs. And this, this is not at all rare in nature. There's quite a few of the uh, skeletal, the vertebrate animals that show it, the whiptail lizard, the Komodo dragon, and the zebra fish. Now, I don't know how much you know about reproduction, but in sexual reproduction, there's a process called meiosis, where a, two cells are made from, well, in four cells are made from one, actually, and 
in that process, the number of chromosomes is halved. Sometimes a parthenogenetic offspring keeps that half number of chromosomes. They're, we call them haploid. And so they're called half clones. But full clones, where the number of uh, chromosomes is doubled up again to the diploid condition is more common. Now, birds and mammals are less likely to produce parthenogenetic offspring. You can see from that slide that uh, it's never been observed in birds. Sorry to cut in. You have 30 seconds left, just oh, as an FYI. Yeah. So you may want to wrap. Okay. okay. Did, you, did you take out the um, the bit that uh, I was interrupted? Did you discount that? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I stopped it when she started talking. Sure. So. Okay. I'm going to leave that slide up as my last slide then. Okay. Did you have, did you have any other remarks? I'm sorry. Or are you ending it here? Well, if if my time has run out, well, you, you have you you have about twenty five seconds. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's that's going to be my last slide. I think. Uh, I consider the evidence for Jesus's virgin birth to be unscientific because no cases of human parthenogenesis have been reliably recorded, and it's unhistoric because of the lack of contemporary independent corroborating sources. And many other sons are claimed. Mithras was one of them. It's not an unbiased claim. The perpetrators of this claim stand to personally benefit. And therefore, for those reasons, I consider it to be highly unlikely to be true. Okay, and that's time. Very good. Okay, so we've had opening statements. And now, um, Nick, when, whenever you are ready, we can move on to rebuttals. And okay, five first. minutes, right? That, that's five minutes. Again, and this is, I know there's a lot of content in both of these opening statements. Um, I want to give you each a chance to respond to kind of the high points, but really this is, the idea is that this is going to move into a discussion between the two of you. I don't expect you to necessarily respond to everything in five minutes, but I wanted to give yeah. you guys a place to start with. So whenever you're ready, I'll let you start talking and I'll start time. Okay. Yeah, there was a, a whole lot there, and a lot of it really didn't seem to matter to the topic at hand, but let's look at some things. First off, the idea about this being a miracle. Yes, it would be a miracle. A miracle is not unscientific. It just means an extra material agent has acted in the universe, and what would have to be shown is that no such extra material agent exists to interact or that nothing like this has happened. Now, there are some great references you can go to to show miracles have happened. The latest one is Craig Keener's book that has just come out, Miracles Today, where he documents several miracles that have medical documentation to them. There is also an interesting book. It's not miracles per se, but it, it's written by, from a secular perspective by, I think, three different authors called The Self Does Not Die, looking at near-death experiences, and again, with medical documentation. Now, in, in John's case, it's going to have to be that all these claims are false, mistaken, or liars, because if just one is true and a miracle has occurred, then miracles can take place. And now he says that the Bible is uncorroborated. Well, for one thing, I wouldn't expect people outside the Bible to be talking about the birth of Jesus. But he says that Josephus just talks about some prophet wandering around. Well, geez, let's look at how this reference begins. About this time lived Jesus, a wise man, if indeed we're not call him a man. And he, he goes on from there. It's a long quote. I've only got five minutes. And there's two different references to it. To, we've got two different manuscripts that say different things because one of them is doctored, we think, but... but by some Christians were aware meaning, but both of them, it's taught at its time there was a wise man called Jesus. Tacitus refers to someone called Christ, 
who was crucified under Pontius Pilate, which is by the by like the only reference we have in Tacitus to Pontius Pilate, and that a movement arose in Jerusalem <clears throat> based on this man. Now, if John has someone else in mind who he thinks this could be, I'm open to hearing it, but I think it seems pretty clear he's talking about Jesus. Now, you can also say, well, these weren't written by contemporaries. Very little of ancient history was written by contemporaries. We, the first reference we have to Hannibal, for instance, the great Carthaginian general who nearly conquered Rome, comes from Polypius, who lived about 40 to 80 years after the events. That's when his writings took place. And lo and behold, that's usually the time frame of the Gospels by skeptical scholars. So if you want to, to throw out this throw this rule out that these sources don't count, then we don't have any sources of Hannibal we can use. Alexander the Great, our biographies come 400 years after he lived. So no, this is not a position. Now, now John says that the church has a lot to benefit from telling a story about the virgin birth, such as the church is extremely wealthy. Not at the start. At the start, Christians were being persecuted numerous times. If you read Paul in 2 Corinthians, he, lived, he gives an account of all the persecution that he went through. There wasn't any benefit to going around and calling yourself a Christian unless you wanted to be on the outs with the Roman Empire and with the Jewish people of the day. So what benefit did Mary get from telling a lie or whoever told this about the virgin birth, which I do affirm? That's going to be for John's show. Now, if John wants to talk about pagan copycats, I would urge him to look up the primary sources, if he can find them, and, and tell me what they are. And the accounts we have of Horace, for instance, Horace's body... <clears throat> is is dismembered and Isis goes and gathers all the body parts together except for one that she can't find and 30 seconds Nick we can all guess what that one body part is and so she reconstructs one has sex with her dead husband then and gets pregnant if someone could tell me how that constitutes as a virgin birth when you have sex with your husband I I'd love to hear that and similar things apply to many of these other deities that supposedly have virgin births. I mean, even someone like Bart Ehrman doesn't really take these kinds of claims that seriously. Hey, Nick, the that's baby. that's going to be time, sir. The, I try again, to give you a 30 second. I from a virgin birth. Okay, <laughs> very very good. We're going to attribute some of that to tech issues. I don't know if he necessarily picks up right when I speak there because I'm trying to be somewhat precise with time. Um, yeah. But anyway, uh, Nick, thank you for that. Uh, John, we'll go to you for uh, for your rebuttal. Okay. Well, I think we're in no doubt that Nick confirms, affirms the virgin birth. That's one thing we do know. So he talked about um, uh, miracles, and he said that uh, if you believe in a supernatural agent, then there's no problem uh, believing in miracles because they're outside of the scientific uh, natural realm. They don't, they don't have to follow the rules. Well, okay, but that's another claim. And I would contend that the onus for demonstrating the existence of a such a supernatural, miraculous, miracle-capable agent is something that Nick has to prove. And I'd give him luck. I wish him luck on that. Then he went on to talk about... Uh, Josephus, or as you Americans like to call it, Josephus. <laughs> you have a predilection for pronouncing the, for stressing the second syllable. Anyway, he, he said that um, Josephus had a good account of the crucifixion. Well, fine, <laughs> you know, I'm sure lots of crucifixions happened. The Romans were quite brutal, and the probability that they crucified this wandering preacher who disagreed with their Jewish and, and Roman gods, uh, a good candidate for crucifixion. But can I remind you that we're talking about the virgin birth? Birth, not 
death. So that's not relevant. Then um, Nick went on to say something about um, other characters from ancient history, which whose uh, accounts were not supported in writing by contemporaries. Well, maybe, but that doesn't strengthen your case, Nick. It weakens it. What you're doing is casting doubt on the whole of ancient history there, rather than specifically the Jesus uh, virgin birth point. And uh, finally, I'm not going to need five minutes. I'm just going to finish off by saying, yes, you're right, Nick. At the beginning, the church wasn't wealthy. Initially, the Christian church wasn't the edifice that we know it to be today. Uh, but that, that doesn't mean that you couldn't earn your living telling the story of the virgin birth and the other parables and stories from the Gospels and even from the Old Testament, because it was like busking in those days. And we still have musicians on the street, artists on the street. And in those days, no television, no cinema, no books to read for most people. So storytelling was a good way of earning your living. In other words, it wasn't an unbiased story because telling it could earn financial reward. I'll leave it there. Very good. I'll, you have about a minute 45 left. I'm going to let you cede that time. Um, and so we're now at the close of the formal part of the debate. I want to open it up, but with a caveat here, because we have this feedback, I'm even having to hear myself. When one person speaks, let's let a pause occur, and then the other person can respond, and we can minimize on the feedback, which is mm -hmm. terrible, if I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah. So with that said, um, I'm going to let you guys open it up. Okay. Well, John, at the start, I want to say that you had said that Josephus doesn't even name Jesus, and yet he explicitly does in, in the source. So that's why I brought it up. John, you're muted. Okay, there you go. Yeah, okay, I'll, I'll concede that if you like, but it still, it still doesn't prove the virgin birth. Yes, and I never went to Josephus to prove a virgin birth. You went to there to show he was uncorroborated and said Josephus doesn't even name him, and so that's the point I wanted to establish. Okay, so he named him. Now, you've also said that if I follow my rule, we could throw out all of ancient history, but no, ancient historians don't think that way, not, not a bit, and I contend the Gospels are early documents within a generation of the events that they took place. It's not quite what I said, Nick. I didn't say that you could throw out all of ancient history. I said that your denigrating of some other characters in ancient history is weak in your case, because you, you really want ancient history to be a really good, reliable source, and what you've done is cast doubt on that. But yes. Actually, I haven't cast doubt on it. It's your methodology that you think everything has to be by contemporaries. Ancient historians don't go with that rule. Well, I'm not, not sure what we're talking about there, but the, the point is that 2,000 years ago, when these things were written, people took a different attitude towards truth and falsehood. And what really mattered was what we would call a ripping yarn, a good tale, you know, comic strip stories do you have any evidence of that well the, certainly have you read the bible it's full of men who have been living inside whales snakes that talk donkeys that talk women made from a man's rib in which case of course she'd have to be male because she would have x y chromosomes from the rib do i need to go on so your whole argument is apparently that because these accounts contain stories, that, that means they didn't care about the truth of the stories, they just cared about a story. 
Yeah, ripping yarns. That's what sold their. That, that's what their trade was in. I tell you a ripping yarn, you give me money because you've enjoyed it. Story. So you time. think the Jews treated their stories as? You cut out there at the end. Nick, say that part again. So you think the Jews consider their stories to be just stories and not true? No, that's again, you're putting words in my mouth. What I'm saying is that today we have a much better understanding of how to arrive at truth and how to substantiate claims. And back then they didn't. They merged the two things together. Falsehood and truth didn't matter too much as long as it told a good story. What they were looking for was people in an audience sat around them, open mouthed and staring at them for the next juicy piece of, of text. Do you have any scholars who are back you on that? <laughs> Not with me. No, hang on. Just let me have a look behind my chair. Uh, are you there? No, no, no. Sorry, I don't have any with me. <laughs> but yeah, Can you yeah, cite I'm... any scholars that were back on that? Well, Bart Erwin, you mentioned he's he's a great uh, he he's a great uh, not quite mythicist. He's almost mythicist. Uh, what about Richard Carrier? He's a hard mythicist, and mm -hmm. uh, I've interviewed him, and I've also interviewed somebody else you talked about. Um, but uh, um, and I want to get, but I uh, haven't succeeded in getting him yet. You said Ehrman is an almost mythicist? Yeah. Hmm. Even though he wrote a whole book called Did Jesus Exist? Refuting Mythicism. Have you seen his YouTube videos of him poking fun at the Bible, New Testament Gospels as a reliable source? Yes, I have, but I've also read his book, Did Jesus Exist, where he refutes mythicism. Well, you, you take what you like from it, don't you? No, I realize that you can be a New Testament scholar who doesn't believe the miracles in the accounts, but you, that still doesn't make you an almost mythicist. Well, let's, should we focus on miracles? Okay. Okay. So you're claiming them, and the virgin birth would be one. It certainly mm -hmm. wouldn't be. It certainly wouldn't be scientific, and the historical evidence is very iffy. So, fall back on the miracle. Now you claimed that. Uh, I don't know whether you cited anybody, but you claimed that there's several medically corroborated miracles. I doubt that. Yes, I did cite someone. I said I cited Craig Keener. He's got the book Miracles Today that recently came out. And he's got a two-volume collection called Miracles mm -hmm. that came out over a decade ago. I also mm. cited the book The Self Does Not Die, which mm. contains several accounts of near-death experiences with ridicule evidence behind them. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. all of these are backed by doctors as well. Each account is followed by sources yeah. that are okay. used. Okay, NDEs. Right, now, it's very tempting, especially in America, where it's, there's a big audience for people who want to read stuff about miracles are true and miracles are real and near-death experiences are actual coming back from being dead. It's very easy for even for a doctor. In fact, being a doctor helps with the credibility to make a lot of money by writing a book that enables people to confirm their biases. Now, I think that medical substantiated miracles have yet to be demonstrated. A near-death experience can be explained by oxygen deprivation of a brain where the circulatory system is disadvantaged. And if people have come back from that, then they they hadn't died. Well, first off, your definition of death would probably need some work because now we got that there are various stages of dying, even about post-death events. But your your explanation for these miracle accounts is bias every time. But this could just as well be bias on your part saying 
well, I don't want these miracle accounts to be true, so I'm going to say these are biased on their end. It, it seems problematic to me that I give you accounts and sources that you go to and you immediately say bias instead of looking at the evidence. And as for these near-death experiences, many of these are when pe these people are technically brain dead or have no consciousness whatsoever. They'd have no way of observing things that they talk about, even things far away from them. And yet they give accounts immediately when they come back about what's happened that's corroborated. That well, all needs to be explained. Okay. Well, brain death is quite difficult to establish. And it's unlikely to be that the equipment that will test for this is unlikely to be beside the bed of an almost dead person, person on their deathbed. So it's easy to claim that somebody was brain dead, gave all the symptoms of being brain dead, and then say, oh, look, they've come back to life. But I, I seriously doubt that any medically corroborated, verified accounts of a miraculous return to life, a resuscitation, that even that wouldn't be um, a return to life because resuscitation, of course, is to save somebody from dying. But reincarnation, I, I, I find it very difficult to accept that that is a convincing verified, valid account of that happening in, from a medical point of view. And as far as people giving accounts of something some distance away from them, when they were not quite dead, but well, there's imagination, there's uh, memory, there's wanting to tell the observers what a person thinks they would like to hear. You know, there's all sorts of reasons other than actually seeing something happening miles away. John, you said that these would take place on a deathbed when medical equipment isn't right there to tell what their status is, but the accounts in myself does not die. Many of them, the majority of them, I'd say, take place in hospitals with doctors there and medical equipment with records of what medical equipment was so do you you want to just distrust for medical equipment now when 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 did when are these accounts dated this book was written within the past decade and all these are come after the time of highly advanced medical technology you really should go and read them well you've given me a reference so maybe i will but i think that you, you'll have a hard job to convince me. Have you read if, Craig Keener? No. If we Why could, not? if I if I could kind of okay. redirect this just slightly, because we, we've gone kind of deeply into the yeah. weeds on NDEs yeah. as a way of establishing yeah. miracles, which I understand the point of that. But to get back yeah. to uh, the the case of the virgin birth specifically, that miracle, um, mm -hmm. you know, whether or not we have a predilection either towards or against the uh, uh, believing that miracles generally happen with regards to this one specifically. Can we kind of can we kind of refocus on that? We've got a few minutes left here and I, and I just want to just try and keep it focused. Yeah. And I think there should probably come a time when John starts questioning me. This is this this isn't um, a cross examination necessarily this is this is kind of like open conversation okay. you you started in yeah i mean he, he's made his points as well john if you do want to ask him some questions i mean this this would be uh, you know a, a fine time for that as well okay well nick mm -hmm. why do you why do you focus all of your energies on the bible i focus where well, i don't focus all my energies on the bible i study many other different topics so what do you exactly mean by focus all my energies? Well, it seems to me that the other sources that you've cited are intended to corroborate the Bible in your mind. So that's your presupposition. The Bible is true. Let's look for what we can find that supports it. 
that's not very really accurate. The self does not die was written by people from a secular perspective, for instance. Craig Keener is written, writing from a Christian perspective. I also had no problem with using Bart Ehrman with Did Jesus Exist? Oh, okay, well, let me let me interrupt you there because The Self Does Not Die sounds like a book that sold millions. Yeah? I have no idea how much it sold. I don't care. Well, books with that sort of title and that sort of content in the United States have a big audience. There is a huge, tempting... Uh, bundle of riches that authors of that sort of book could make. What you need to do to get really convincing evidence is look at boring scientific reports, which don't sell. <laughs> they sell to nobody. But that means that there's no ulterior motive for the author to have written them. John, this just seems like a cop out time after time when as soon as I mention any source, you jump straight to bias and money and as if you want to implicate everyone as being greedy before you say, yeah, this could be true when you haven't even read the source yourself. Well, I, <laughs> I, I would, I'm, an, I'm a retired science teacher. So my bias is that scientific accounts are unbiased, they're impartial, they have to be, because the, uh, the, the attempt is to achieve close to objectivity. And this is the reason why the Royal Society here in London, the oldest scientific establishment in the world, has the motto, nullius in verba, which means nothing in words. That's the point. Words are a means of earning money. So don't write sensational stuff and, or don't expect me to be convinced by authors of sensational stuff because they had an ulterior motive. They wanted to make money. John, you really need to demonstrate something like that instead. Yeah, all you're giving me is words. And as you've said, nothing in words. I've just demonstrated it to you by telling you. No, you haven't. By telling you the motto of the Royal Society, nullius in verba. That's not a demonstration. <laughs> it is for me. Well, I guess you're easily convinced. <laughs> now, now we we've, we've talked well, about the let's, accounts. Let's move on. Yes, go ahead, Nick. Yes. Now, we've, we've talked about the accounts in scripture, and you were asking me why I take them seriously. Um, John, let me ask you a question. Have you read any academic scholars of the, the Bible that are Christians? Well, why would I? Have, listen, let me return that question to you. Have you read any academic scholars of the Quran who were Muslim? I've read some Muslims. Yes, I have. Do they substantiate the Quran? Or why? What about what about academic scholars of the Vedas who were Hindu? Have you read? I those? haven't spent a lot of time studying Hinduism. It's not my main area. I study why? biblical matters. Why? Why have you not done that? Because that's what you're asking me. You're asking me why I haven't studied Christianity, and I'm returning the favor and asking you why you haven't studied Hinduism. I didn't say I haven't studied it. I've said it's not a focus, but I've said if I was making it a focus, I would be reading scholars on both sides of the fence of Hinduism. If mm. you're going to be arguing Christian claims, you need to read both sides of a Christian debate. Mm -hmm. So what about Mormonism? Yes. You studied that? What about yes. Scientology? Have you studied that? No. What about the uh, Jesuits? Have you studied them? Some. I've read some Catholic writers, but I really don't see the point of asking what I have and haven't well, studied. I'm asking what you've studied. And if you haven't read anything that this argues against what you hold, 
then I could just where say you have bias because you're hesitant to read anything that disagrees of what believe what disagrees with you. I've read a lot of science textbooks. Have you? No, which is why I don't argue science. But science and religion are in opposition because they both have explanations for all sorts of things that disagree. You have an explanation based on biblical knowledge that, for example, it's possible for a human to be fathered by a supernatural agent whose existence you haven't demonstrated and that his mother was a virgin and that's not being demonstrated either. And the, there's a far more likely scientific explanation here, which is that Mary was impregnated by Joseph and somebody thought this is a good idea we'll turn it into a story that's probable so we what you're saying like it, i want to interject just briefly here nick before you respond so it, basically you're saying that you're you're taking an analysis of the situation and saying is it more likely that there was this was a supernatural conception or did somebody make it up essentially and you're leaning in that direction Nick, what if you can state concisely what for you leans you in the other direction in this case? Okay, well, first off, I'd like to state that I've never used the word supernatural. That's John's word. For me, what states it is that the Bible, whenever I, I test it in many areas, it does show to be historically reliable, especially in the area of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. And so I really have no reason then to discount the virgin birth accounts which i do affirm when i see historical corroboration of the bible over and over again i see so you're if if i can put a synopsis on that that it's you're you're basing your analysis off the general reliability of the gospel accounts is that accurate yes okay do we do we want to go from there to proceed for just yes. a few more minutes we're coming up on like uh, about 110 live i was going to give it to about 120 um, just okay. to finish fleshing out this conversation, but let's try and keep it focused um, and then okay. bring it to a close, okay? Okay. okay. John, right. you're using the conflict hypothesis when you talk about science and religion, which was popular with the writings of Andrew Dixon White and others. You never consider that those people have bias, and, and White definitely had a great bias, and his account is shown by historians of religion and science to be utterly filled with if falsehoods entirely there's hardly anyone except for in the staunch atheist side and dare i say it the staunch side of many christians who are say yecs for instance who holds the conflict the hypothesis i'm not sure what your point is there nick my point is you're treating science and religion as if they're opposites terms you haven't even defined yet or they contradict when really that's not the, the most popular opinion here today usually the, oh. the two are seen as opposed in the sense of my fingers and thumbs are opposed so they can grasp everything between them and they study things in a different area and by the way i'd like to state that i did give a brief case for the existence of god i said i go with a thomistic argument so my claim is not unsubstantiated entirely i just okay. said that's another debate okay yes it is another debate but the Thomistic argument is an argument. It's not evidence. That's a big problem for theists. They don't seem to understand the difference between those two things. Now, what else did you say? Um, I, I lost track, to be honest. The reason that religion and science are opposites, as I said, is because they have different explanations. For example, science explanation for the arrival of humans on this planet is by birth, which requires a sperm and an egg to have met to form a zygote and to have developed through embryo and fetus and so on. And religion's explanation for this, in the case of Jesus at least, is poof, some god did it. And another example would be the origin of the planet. 
because the scientific origin of the planet it is cosmology, you know, the, the elements formed and condensed because of gravity into balls. And we have a pretty good explanation for how the solar system, uh, the galaxies, the stars, the asteroids, everything originated. And what religion says is God done it in seven days. Now, you can't possibly say that, that uh, they are not contrary explanations. Have you read John Wharton with his work such as The Lost World of Genesis 1? No. Would I waste my time doing that? It, it, no okay, more. so I guess you're not open to a contrary interpretation of Genesis 1 would prefer to well, stick with one that holds your opinion. In the same way that you're not open to studying Hinduism to find out why Ganesh, the elephant-headed god, is not true. Or I never it? said I'm not open to studying Hinduism, but if I was going to India and I was going to be talking with Hindus, I'd be studying Hinduism as much as I could. Well, as a tourist, so would I. But we're talking about the difference between truth and fiction here. Mm -hmm. Well, John, I just keep wondering, why is it you're arguing with Christians so much, but you don't read what Christians think about, especially the leading scholars? I don't just argue against Christians. That is a fallacy. In fact, I can direct you to a debate I had with a Muslim only, what, uh, just over a year ago, about 18 months ago, at Manchester University. And that's on my channel, Free Thought Productions. So let me plug my channel, <laughs> Free Thought Productions. I'll give you guys a chance to do that again at the end, okay? But, and go ahead, and go did, ahead. did you read any Muslim scholars in preparation for that? No. <laughs> But I didn't need to because the arguments that he came up with were scientific bunkum. You can watch the you can watch the debate. It it's rather well filmed by the uh, Islamic Education and uh, I can't remember the name. I uh, Islamic I can't remember the name. Uh, it's a it's a society that deals with students at, mu at uh, British music mu British universities, and they have a great kit of cameras and microphones. In fact, on the poster for this, you can see me festooned with microphones at that event. Uh, John, it seems like you have a hesitancy to read scholarly material that disagrees with you. I only have a limited life, Nick. <laughs> and, so do um, I. I really don't want to waste my time wading through nonsense. So you consider it a waste of time to read what educated people say on a subject? Well, if it's not, if it has no scientific background, yes. So do you have a position of scientism in that the only way to know if something is true is if it's by science? Well, scientism is a word invented for the denigration of science. It assumes, in fact, the ism ending on the word science makes out that it's an ideology, which is untrue. Science is not an ideology, it's a means of discovery. We have no principles or values or doctrines or scriptures that specify any policies of science. And what is Massimo Pigliucci arguing against when he argues against scientism? Uh, well, I wouldn't know. Could you could you give you us a synopsis? Because uh, I mean, I'm there's probably a lot of people who are not familiar with that reference. Massimo Pigliucci is an evolutionary scientist. He even runs Darwin Day, or at least is heavily involved with it here at UT in, in the state where I live. He he's an He's not a Christian in any way, but he has a strong stance against scientism, but it does a great disservice to science. Well, I, I would agree with him because it misrepresents science as though it's an ideology, which it isn't. Yeah, Massimo is a great evolutionist. Uh, well, again, I wouldn't call him an evolutionist. That's for word. He's a great uh, scientist. But Many of these scientists, I could think of Michael Behe and uh, who, who's the other one, they've sold out to the Answers in Genesis crew or the Discovery Institute. These people are not in it for science. 
These people are in it for dogma, doctrine, and making money out of Christians. John, it, again, it just seems that you're hesitant to read anything contrary thought, and when you encounter something like that, you jump immediately to money or something else, while your side is entirely pure and innocent of any any ulterior motives whatsoever. Well, if you if you look at scientific accounts, they're very boring. Nobody buys them. Just a few people in in that regime with the same expertise around the world. They may maybe they maybe get get rid of a half a dozen copies, and they don't make a profit on that. You know, it's just the cost. So, science is not a money making enterprise. The application of it may be, you know, but that's not determined by scientists. That's determined by businessmen and politicians. There are theological journals also that aren't out there to make money. Oh, granted, there, there are lots of books that don't sell. I've got a couple, one of which you... I reviewed. didn't say book, I said journal. Okay, journal. But one, one of these books of mine you may re recognize because you reviewed it. Yeah. That was when I was using my nom de plume. I've since written another one. Okay. I expect you would give me a scathing review for that one too. Probably. My nom de plume, my nom de plume was Elliot George. But I could also point out the new atheist books were consistently bestsellers and sold very well. Should we discount them because of that? Only if their claims cannot be substantiated. Now, if you're thinking of the God delusion, for example, everything in there is based on science. You can test, you can, you can look at the claims and examine them. And they are not miraculous. John, I've read the God delusion because I do read books that disagree with me. And I've uh -huh. written a refutation of it on my website as well. Does that surprise and not me? everything in there is scientific. He looks at philosophical arguments, for instance. Yes, and Richard yes. Dawkins, I'll, I'll grant Richard Dawkins is an excellent science. When he writes about scientific matters, yes. it yes. is beautiful material to read. But yes. when he writes about philosophy or think. history, yes. he's writing about something he doesn't know about. Well, he admits himself that he's not a philosopher. So that's hardly a surprise. But yet you said everything in there can be substantiated scientifically, but the philosophical arguments he has can't be. No, well, that is one of the problems with philosophy, isn't it? It's just all opinions that cannot be countered or verified. Is that your opinion? Uh, not entirely, no. <laughs> I'm, speaking, I'm speaking off the cuff here. If you want to find out what my opinion of philosophy is, I'll write you a paper. But there is a place where logical reasoning is of great value. And that is in mysteries, in situations where we don't know. And then all we can do is speculate. We would call it hypothesize. And that's where logic comes in and we couldn't manage without it. The difference between philosophy and science is that science then has an essential second step which is called investigation. And uh, I should say that was actually a philosophical thing too, because back in the Renaissance, people realized that you can't think your way to an explanation every time. And then you, therefore you need to test your inferences that have come out of your reasoning. That doesn't come from the Renaissance. That was being done long before the Renaissance. Read a book like God's well, Philosopher yeah, yeah, by yeah, James yeah. Hannum, or look at Tim O'Neill's website, Tim O'Neill, an atheist yeah, yeah. library. When do you, you document when do you, science in the Middle Ages? When, we've got to discuss what when the re Renaissance is then, because a lot of people would contend that the Renaissance rumbled on for 400 years. No, we don't have to contend when it was. Whenever it was, there was already work being done long before. And I think there were experiments being done on, for instance, the nature of light in even the sixth ah, century. Again, read God's philosophers yeah. or read well, Tim O'Neill, who okay. comes from an atheist yeah, well, perspective. Okay, okay. Well, the reason I referred to the Renaissance is because that's when the idea of natural philosophy was born, which we would now call 
science. And of course, science was being done by Stone Age man. When they put those green rocks on the fire and heated them up and they ran out as a pinky yellow metal, that was science, but it wasn't called science. Nobody knew about scientific method. Now, and science didn't really take off until the Christian era. Before uh, then, people weren't really know? doing it because of what? polytheistic worldviews and ever such things. It was when the world was established in the minds of men to be coming from one rational being that they figured the universe had to be rational and thus they started doing science in a much more serious fashion than had ever been done before. Well, that's not true, because science and maths and experimentation began long before Christianity. It goes back, I don't know how many centuries, and the Muslims had a good bash at it too, and so did the, the Indians in the, in the early days of their civilization. So you can't claim that science is the child of Christianity. Oh, no. You do know the Muslims came after the Christians, right? Yeah, sorry, I didn't mean the Muslims. I meant the, uh, they did come after. But of course, what you're claiming is that science was invented during the Renaissance by the Christians, and that isn't the case. No, I'm not. It was, it was going on before. But a lot of it was that there were Indian uh, scientists predating Christianity and Islam. Mm -hmm. Sure, experiments and things like were going on, but Christianity really caused the skyrocketing of science and the no. advancement, the no, establishment no. of universities and education no, for the no, purpose no, of studying no. science. Not, not true. They imprisoned <laughs> Galileo. They burnt, was it Copernicus? No, it was another stargazer. Christianity, Christianity has been a break on scientific development. Look at today. They're preventing... Uh, genetic uh, experiments, they're preventing abortion, <laughs> they're doing all sorts of things to stop science developing. Can you tell me a single Christian that was put to death in the Middle Ages for doing science? Everybody in the Middle Ages was Christian in Western Europe, pretty much. So whoever was put to death at that time, and there were several, was a Christian. Can you but, name one during the Middle Ages that was put to death for doing science? This isn't a naming Gents, thing. Uh, guys, uh, are cut in here again, because uh, we are pretty much at time, and we have once again kind of gotten off. I, I think if there, there's any takeaway for this is, for me anyway, that to even be able to have a conversation about whether or not the specific miracle of the virgin birth occurred, there has to be so many background conversations that have to happen, which is why I yeah. think we kept going off into the weeds with regards to either the general reliability of the gospels, science versus religion, um, you know, historicity in general, uh, you know, and then now we've gotten to this thing and who gets to take credit for what, which, which is kind of off uh, from, from where we need to be at. Um, I want to give you guys each just a moment for a final statement. I won't time it necessarily, but just kind of a final point from each of you. And then I want to bring it to a close. Okay. And I assume we can plug our sites and things like that. Again, please, right? do. please do. Absolutely. Okay. Well, I can be found at deeperwatersapologetics.com. <clears throat> and my encouragement on this is <clears throat> go out and read both sides. Read the best Christians you can on the topic of this. And read the best skeptics that you can. Come to your conclusions and have reasons for your conclusions why you think they're true. Don't be afraid of contrary thought. And of course, I affirm the Virgin Birth. Very nice. John. Well, there's been a couple of uh, comments coming in from various viewers. Thank you for watching, by the way, peeps. So, science is religion. I'm not sure what that's meant to mean. Uh, but thanks for watching, Adam. Thanks, Tim. The Chinese were very advanced with no Christian influences. Absolutely. Yeah, they invented gunpowder and all sorts of things. Yep, you're right, Tim. And there's some other less pleasant <laughs> points here. 
<laughs> which I'm not going to scream. Uh, but yeah, th thanks, Nick. I've enjoyed this, even though I had to wait for my dinner. <laughs> that, uh, but the point is that there's, as as uh, David said, this debate doesn't stop within the confines of the topic, does it? As soon as you pick at whether Jesus was born of a virgin or not, even though you may have prepared for that, you've got to be ready to quote all sorts of other things from all sorts of other fields because they can be brought up. Now, I'm strictly a retired science teacher and I would be happy to debate the reliability of the Bible with Nick another time. I would be happy to explain. In fact, I've already got these on my site, which I can put up now. It's um, I do two shows a week. There is um, this one, Free Thought Hour, in, in which I interview somebody on this or in a similar format to this. I've done lots of people, Christians, non-Christians, um, uh, pirates, <laughs> you know, um, what are they called? The, 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 um, the, the, pastor the, the spaghetti monster people. Yeah, yeah. that's the well, one. I think I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Pastafarians. Thank yeah. you. So, uh, uh, that's one show I do. And I also do global atheist news, which goes out. Both of these go out on a Saturday night. And I recommend them to you. They get quite a few viewers and, uh, and quite a lot of nice com comments. So thanks, David, for having us. Absolutely. Um, really appreciate it. Yes, thanks. Uh, yeah, thank you. And thank you both uh, for coming on, taking this time. Um, I enjoyed this. Uh, it's It was weird for me because it's my, my first time officially moderating to just sit back through all of it. I think you both made some good points. Um, and it really does just open this up to a much bigger conversation that needs to be had um, before you can really get down into something specific as the virgin birth, um, as I said. Uh, for myself, I I, of course you do. <laughs> <laughs> if you take nothing else away, take away that Nick affirms the virgin birth. All right. Um, uh, for myself, uh, I host the Fermenting Opinions podcast. You can find us on iTunes Beyond Pod. Uh, I have a YouTube channel that I am resurrecting from the dust. Uh, I'm also on Facebook. I have a page and group there. Please check me out. Um, that said, uh, again, really enjoyed this. Thank you both so much for your time. Thank you for letting me uh, take over your your channel, John. Um, yeah. This is a fun platform. I'm going to have to start using it myself. Do it. Yeah, um, StreamYard is great. But absolutely. Uh, and, and that said, again, thank you, everybody. Um, and we're going to call it here. Great. Bye-bye. Bye now. Mm -hmm.